Hi, this is Matt McCormick uh, in the Department of Philosophy at California State University, Sacramento. This is a lecture for my Philosophy of Mind course, uh, Phil 153. And um, we're at a position at a point in the course where we need to talk about neuroscience and the philosophy of mind. We've traversed several centuries of uh, developments in philosophy of mind from Descartes up to the 20th century. And uh, we're more or less up to speed on some basics. And it's my view that we can't responsibly do uh, discussion or theorizing or analysis about what it is to have a mind uh, unless we know something about what how brains work. Minds and brains are pretty clearly tightly inter interrelated. And um, the cognitive revolution in neuroscience in the last 50 years or so has uh, rapidly expanded how much we understand about what's going on in brains from the neural level all the way up to the macro systems level and that's exposing revealing a lot about the nature of consciousness the chemical electrical foundation of consciousness um, alterations in consciousness and so on um, so we need to have some background in neuroscience and about brain science to be able to uh, talk and be more informed about theories, philosophical theories about, about consciousness as we, as we move forward. Okay, so you will recall a problem that I raised earlier in the semester that we've called, that's known as Leibniz's mill problem. <clears throat> Leibniz says, uh, it's not a problem for Leibniz, he's sure he's got the answer. Moreover, we must confess that perception and what depends on it is inexplicable in terms of mechanical reasons. That is, through shapes and motions. If we imagine that there is a machine whose structure makes it think, sense, and have perceptions, we could conceive it enlarged, keeping the same proportions so that we could enter into it as one enters into a mill. Assuming that, when inspecting the, its interior, we will only find parts that push one another, and we will never find anything to explain a perception. And so we should seek perception in the simple substance and not in the composite or in the machine. So Leibniz has got a famously idealistic view here, an immaterial view about consciousness. But the point is, imagine that we could take the brain and blow it up and make it really big, or imagine we could take you and shrink you down super small, like that old movie, uh, Fantastic Voyage. Um, imagine we can make you the size of an atom, and then we send you into the brain to look. Where's consciousness? Where are thoughts? Where are perceptions? Where are feelings? Where's the sonnets? Where's the poetry? Where's the metaphors? You'd go and you'd look, and what you'd see in there, updating the example for, for, the modern, uh, for modern knowledge about brains, what you'd see in there is chemistry. You'd see chemical interactions. You'd see sodium and potassium ions. You'd see electrical conductivity down the, uh, down the neurons. Um, but you'd never see, you'd never observe a color, a feeling, a concept, a perception. You'd never see the thing in there. And the, the strangeness and the difference, the radical difference between what it is to subjectively feel a thought versus what some machine is configured of that allegedly produces the thoughts is so outrageous it leads Leibniz to conclude we've got to look somewhere else for thoughts. They can't possibly be in there. They're of a utterly different species or an utterly different kind of thing. So, um, so the problem, the challenge for us, because we're not going to adopt an idealistic view like or an immaterial view like Leibniz, the problem then is how do we explain thought or feeling um, at the macro level, at the conscious subjective level, uh, in terms of mechanism, of chemistry, of physics, of what's going on down uh, in the brain. How can we get from what neurons do <clears throat> when they transfer their uh, electrical information down the axons to, you know, this is a passage from uh, a famous romantic poet, Percy Shelley, uh, the sunlight claps the earth, and the moonbeams kiss the sea. What are all these kissings worth if thou not ki if if thou kiss not me? Right. So, uh, you know, classic bit of sort of sappy romantic poetry. Uh, but you you can understand or appreciate the 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 feeling of that passage, right? Or the look of sunlight on the earth or moonbeams on the sea, right? Those are those are images that subjectively you have experience of as a conscious being. How does that come out of meat, right? Or perhaps to make things even more uh, bizarre, 
um, here's a recording of a neuron. Don't know if you can hear it on the on the uh, on my recording, but what's happening here is that that we've actually recorded the electroactivity, and there's just this ticking noise, a neuron that's part of a orchestrated synchronized network of other neurons is getting some stimulation. Who knows what's happening? They're watching, you know, some subject is watching an episode of Friends in an fMRI machine or something. And we've, we're recording the activity of the neuron and it's ticking. It's just making these little rapid signals, right? How do you get from that? From, from mere um, pulsing signals of electricity to feels. Okay, well, let's talk about the parts, the mechanism, the mill. Let's talk about what's down there and we'll get some insight into what they can produce um, at the macro, at the bigger level. So neurons then, and this is the like more straightforward uh, neural anatomy part of the course. Uh, and I'm no expert here. I'm way out of my element, out of my league. Um, but we're going to learn enough and be tested on enough and acquire enough sort of really basic uh, rudimentary neuroscience knowledge to be able to talk about this in, in terms of how it connects to philosophical theories. So neurons. There's two kinds. There's neurons and glial cells, and roughly speaking, there are about 83 billion neurons in a human brain, and each one of those has got dendritic connections, so it has parts. Um, and um, our reading for this week, um, our neuroscience webpage reading that I sent you to, uh, written by Robert Stuff Stuffelbeam. Stuffelbeam's got very good uh, animations, very good analyses, and very good explanations of all this. So I'm just going to review it briefly. But there's a cell body, and um, there's the um, the metabolic, which is the metabolic control center of the cell, um, and that's sort of the manufacturing and recycling plant where all this metabolic activity goes on. That's where you know glucose that you eat with your dinner gets uh, consumed and used up for energy and, and produces uh, cellular activity. And we're going to talk about what that is in a second. So what happens is that incoming signals from some prior neuron usually. Um, come in through the dendrite side. So the dendrites in this picture are the long, spiky, pointed um, arms to the left. And then incoming signals come in at the dendrites. And then outgoing signals flow out along the axon, which is that long, sort of trumpet-like um, uh, body that goes off the side, side that goes off the main body. And the axon terminal is the place where the signal within the neuron ends. And um, axon terminal, terminals contain neurotransmitters. And those are the chemical signals that flow from one neuron to another. So uh, primarily, uh, the uh, signaling activity within a neuron is electrical that moves down the membrane of the wall. And then um, uh, signaling that goes across neurons is uh, through neurotransmitters. So neurons engage in intracellular sig signaling, communication within the cell, and intercellular signaling, communication between cells. Um, and this is done electrically by conduction, so neurons send electrical signals along their axons. Each neuron has an action potential. So uh, that's the chemical ability to build up a charge, and it does it with um, positive or negative ions of usually sodium and potassium. Um, and once this neuron gets, it's a very simple, very, uh, very dumb little switch device that once um, it metabolically gets up to a certain level of a uh, potential of a charge and it gets uh, triggered by its previous neighbors, um, then it sends a signal down to its next uh, downstream neighbor uh, uh, in, the, in the network. Okay, so neurotransmission then is intercellular and that's communication between neurons and that happens by the transmission of little uh, very specialized uh, molecules that go out through the axon terminal and then they reach across, uh, go across the synaptic gap to the dendrites on the next uh, neuron. The cell body generates an action potential, or it's an electrical signal. It's a charge that builds up in there. And that electrical signal cascades down the membrane of the neuron, catalyzed by the exchange of sodium and potassium ions inside and outside through the ion channels. And Stuffelbeam's animations show in more detail how it is that 
um, the charge builds up by changing the concentration of positive and negative ions on different sides inside and outside of the cell membrane. Normally the cell membrane is a barrier to ions. When a neurotransmitter is present, that is at the dendrite, it will trigger the opening or closing of ion channels in the membrane that allow the ions to move across, thus changing the charge of the cell membrane. Okay, so uh, the concentration of ions on the inside changes the electrical property of the membrane, so the thing gets more and more charged up. It's a bit like, you know, I think of it like a static electricity charge. You know, you, you, uh, you, you rub on the carpet with your hand, and your body gets all built up with the charge, and it takes contact with another body to discharge that shock, so it's a bit like um, that charge building up on the body. Um, and then uh, under normal metabolic activity, a resting polarized neuron will develop this negative about minus 70 millivolt charge. Uh, that's its sort of resting potential. It's got this charge waiting to discharge if it gets the right kinds of signal from its neighbors. And we're going to talk a lot shortly about what it takes from its neighbors um, and what happens when it's embedded in a network like that. So ions flowing in and out through the ion channels during neurotransmission will make the inside of the target neuron more positive, hence depolarized. Um, and when this depolarization reaches a point of no return called a threshold, a large electrical signal is generated. This is the action potential. So it goes to minus 70 millivolts, and then all these other neurons keep ticking at it, keep um, charging at it, keep uh, signaling to it, and that changes the thing's chemical composition until it builds up and builds up and builds up, and then it snaps. It goes and it pops and sends a signal down its line, and then returns back to its resting state. And typically, neurons will do this, you know, dozens or hundreds of times a second. So this metabolic activity is, is constant, and it's going, it's going on um, uh, constantly and very fast. Uh, so the thing is re- um, metabolizing and resetting to its uh, normal resting state, you know, hundreds of times a second, and then getting um, shouts from its neighbors, uh, shouts of enough volume and enough um, uh, of the right sort to finally make it discharge and then go back to its um, metabolic resting state over and over and over again. Okay, so this uh, capacity to send the signal down um, is called this thing's action potential. All right, that's going to be a very important concept for us later. Okay, so the signal's then propagated down along the axon. So the direction of flow is that it, the signal comes in through the dendrites and then goes down and out through the axon until it reaches the terminal. And there, um, the, the rates here are actually, I mean, Stuffelbeam says it's quick, but I mean, in terms of, um, we're thinking about the speed of thought or thinking about the speed of, of pain or a smashed thumb or something, the rates are surprisingly slow. The rates are up to 150 meters per second. I mean, that's surprisingly um, slow, 500 feet per second. You can see something move that fast. Um, you know, uh, uh, hence, hence many of the sort of processing computational challenges that we face when we're um, you know, trying to deal with fast-moving events, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the speed of a, a major league baseball pitch is, you know, nearly 100 miles an hour, and the batter is reacting and swinging the bat long before um, the full-on processing can make it around to the frontal lobe, and the batter can sort of form a judgment or think or make a resolution about anything. This is all happening at a very low, very instinctual, um, very fast um uh, sort of truncated level. Um, most of our thought, the sort of stuff that happens up in the frontal lobe takes much longer and we'd be, we'd be much too slow if it, we weren't programmed to do some of these things um, down at the deep level. Um, so electrical conduction then uh, along the body of the neuron ends at the axon terminal and then that's where neurotransmission begins. Um, Hence, it's at the axon terminal where the neuron sends its output to the other neurons um, that are have got their dendrites there nearby, and they're picking up the signals coming in. Um, so it's got uh, uh, electrical signals that course along the surface of it, and it's got neurotransmitter or chemical uh, signals that go across the uh, dendritic gap. Okay, so we've got electrical neurotransmission. So um, 
so there's a couple different kinds of neural communication just to make things more complicated. Um, we've been talking about chemical neurotransmission. I'll talk about that first. Um, that happens at the neurotransmitter uh, at the at the uh, axon terminal gap. But sometimes you can have these cases where uh, the dendrites or um, in the picture on the right from Stufflebeam's website, the two at the bottom right, the two, uh, we've got two dendritic arms that are rubbing against each other. They're laid across each other. And, you know, we're talking about organic systems here. You can have some signal spillover in a case like that where um, those two dendrites, even from different neurons, since they're just in such close proximity to each other, when one of them fires, the other can develop a propensity to fire. Um, so that's just an electrical, it's like an electrical short that's just discharging at the, right next to each other. But the sort of classic, um, um, you know, uh, archetypal notion of a, of neurotransmission uh, is where the axon terminal then dumps some neurotransmitters like norepinephrine or serotonin into the gap, and then those get picked up on the other side. Okay, so there's those two kinds, and they turn out to be very complicated, and they add to the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of connections that even a single neuron can have. So we've got 83 billion neurons with you know tens of thousands of connections each. So the you know the 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 amount of um, <clears throat> signal connective activity that's happening here is just staggering us more than the number of atoms in the universe. Um, hence, leading to problems we'll see later with proposals or, or science fiction scenarios about the possibility of reducing down or capturing um, uh, the mind and uploading it to the internet or something. Uh, one of the biggest challenges here is just simply we can't possibly uh, uh, produce enough computational power to capture all of the the number of uh, uh, neural connections that are being made. You know, millions and millions of them being made every second in your brain across all these uh, billions of neurons. Uh, so that's just making that project really hard by itself. Okay, so the neurotransmitters then. <clears throat> that happen across that gap. There's seven of these. You probably seven main ones you've probably heard of: acetyl, uh, acetylcholine, dopamine, GABA, glutamate, histamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Um, you've no doubt heard of all of these and heard about the maybe the uh, the activity of of some um, psychoactive drugs on some of those sites. And I'll just as a brief aside here, just make a note. Um, you know, there's lots of interesting research come out in recent years about the love neurotransmitters. Uh, two of the big ones here are oxytocin and vasopressin. And we're wondering about Leibniz's mill problem. <clears throat> how, is it, how is it that uh, uh, the mirror mechanism or physics or chemistry can produce feelings? Well, uh, modern neuroscience and philosophy of mind is, is zeroing in on answers here. Here's some really interesting research. Uh, there are these two species of, they're called voles, prairie voles and mountain voles. They're like a little hamster animal. And they've diverged from, the two species have diverged from each other. One of them, the prairie voles, are prone or, or habitually, typically, they form lifelong monogamous pairs. So they uh, they encounter each other, the male and female. They they mate, and then they're bonded for life. Uh, the other set of the other species of uh, voles, the mountain voles, um, are much more promiscuous. They have multiple um, other vole partners over the course of their lives, and they don't form these monogamous lifelong pairs. Okay, so uh, neuroscientists start looking at this more carefully, and they find a couple of interesting things. One of them is that the prairie voles, the ones who do form monogamous lifelong pairs, they have more receptors in their brains through some sort of genetic variation. Um, just through evolution, they have more genetic receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin. Um, that is when, and, and both of those neurotransmitters are given off during sexual activity, um, uh, orgasms produce those feelings, they're feelings of, of sort of warmth and love and closeness and connection. Um, so the cute little prairie voles um, have got lots of receptors in their brains 
uh, for these um, uh, neurotransmitters. And so when they are in the right kinds of circumstances and they have, you know, they get connected up with each other and they have sex, they have little prairie vole feelings that resonate and register with lots of oxytocin and vasopressin getting dumped into their little brains. The mountain voles, um, who I imagine are, are, uh, are, are grumpier and much stingier with their emotions, um, and they're normally much more promiscuous and they move around across different partners, right? So they don't care. Um, they aren't particularly attached. Well, it turns out you can dose them with um, extra oxytocin and vasopressin. So you put two of them in a cage together and you give... Uh, you give them uh, an extra shot of oxytocin or vasopressin. I think actually it might have been a, a, a nasal inhaler. Maybe you pump the air full of oxytocin and vasopressin. And these two mountain voles become madly in love with each other, and they become sort of monogamous, um, uh, more like a lifelong uh, pair bond. Right, so even though they they're a bit debilitated by not having as many of the uh, receptor sites, if you dump enough oxytocin and vasopressin in there, they feel like they're in love and they feel like the the prayer voles, uh, having feelings they've never had before. The cute little guys. Um, similarly, uh, my other picture there is uh, of the of the MDMA ecstasy uh, molecule, which causes a dump of serotonin into the gap in the in neurotransmission, um, and that has a whole bunch of interesting effects. Um, uh, I typically assign it. Uh, uh, well, it, that has a whole bunch of interesting effects. I'll leave that up to your own research. Um, okay, so more we need to learn about brains. Uh, one of the things that neural networks do that we're going to talk a lot about in the next lecture is that they learn. When, ter when two neurons are frequently fired together, so when, say, we have A fires and then B fires, so imagine that B is in a network where A is upstream, um, and A is part of a whole bunch of other neurons that um, fire nearby, and they and A fires often enough that it manages to meet the activation threshold for B, and B then triggers and fires and passes the signal on. So now you start getting this um, this event: A fires, then B fires; A fires, then B fires. When they frequently fire together in that sort of fashion, what happens is there's a net improvement in the communication channel between those two neurons. In the synaptic transmission, the postsynaptic neuron becomes increasingly more sensitive to signals from the presynaptic one. So that is, B gets sensitive to, or chemically what happens is, that it starts listening to A more closely. Or when A fires, B gets more uh, a stronger propensity to fire in response to a signal. Uh, so these two get um, wired together. So the, the slogan here, the thing you have to know, the thing that everybody learns in sort of basic neuroscience is that neurons that fire together wire together. So for instance, in human infants, you've got you know, billions and billions of all these dendritic connections all over their brains, and one of the things happening is there's a massive die-off um, as their brains, as they learn, um, there's a shrinking of dendritic connections as the, to you know, human toddler learns how to do things. A human toddler learns how to manipulate the blocks and stack them up and make a pile. Um, and doing that over and over and over again habituates and creates this long-term potentiation for certain sets of neurons, but not others. You, the, the baby, the infant, is fine-tuning their motor skills and getting better and better at a certain task, and that's because those channels are getting better and better wired. Um, and the same goes for everything else a human infant is learning, about words, about pointing at the dog and saying doggy, about concepts, and all the other things that mom and dad are teaching them about. So there's... Um, uh, this improvement of certain channels. You can think of it as like um, there's this huge map and some pathways are becoming like highways by the amount of traffic that's traveling through them and other pathways are dwindling and sort of receding into mere footpaths and getting um, uh, they're getting a you know, much greater lack of use or, or much more disuse. Okay, so during learning of new cognitive ta tasks, there is widespread increased activity in many areas of the brain. Then, as long-term potentiation develops and the task is mastered, much activity drops off, the requisite neural nets improve. So it's like when you're learning how to do something new. Maybe you go uh, play tennis for the first time. You don't know how to hold the racket. You don't know which way to stand. You don't 
you don't understand the rules, you're overwhelmed, you're cognitively got this massive load on you, um, you feel exhausted trying to keep up and trying to understand everything's happening. And then as you do it more and more and you get better and better at it, um, lots of that sort of noisy uh, uh, lateral um, co collateral activity in the brain drops off as you get get it wired in, literally get it wired in what it is you're supposed to do to do a backhand, what it is you're supposed to do to do a forehand, and what have you. Um, okay, so now let's get, now we're in a place to talk about some of the philosophical issues, right? We can make some drawbacks, some connections. All right, so one of the big issues um, that uh, philosophers and cognitive scientists and neuroscientists are working on and wondering about is called the neural correlates of consciousness. Uh, so I'm going to state this a little bit formally, but you'll see what it's about right away. That is, when I have a thought on the inside, when I make a decision, when I recall a memory, here's the question. What are the neural chemical brain state events that correspond such that the presence or absence of those states correlates with the presence or absence of that thought, decision, or memory. So we're trying to zero in on, okay, when that thought is present, what brain states are present? And when the thought goes out of your mind, what's the collateral or what's the correlated um, change in the state of the brain? Uh, and there's lots of really interesting ways to try to zero in on this. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons we want to zero in on the on the NCCs, is that they're going to reveal what's going on mentally, um, which is the ground or the source of consciousness. We're going to zero in on um, what is it to have a certain thought. Well, it looks like being in this brain state tracks directly on that thought. So this brain state or these structures or these kinds of events in the brain must uh, connect to or account for how it is you can be in that brain state or be in that mental state. Um, so the neuroscience of consciousness or altered or pathological consciousness, the NCCs are going to reveal lots here. Um, so an example I, I've got up here is um, from Christoph Cook. This thing is an old famous optical illusion. It's called a Necker cube. And you'll be able to see that you can, you can do this trick. You can consciously, subjectively do this trick where you look at the line drawing of the cube and you can switch your uh, interpretation or your mental understanding of that line drawing on the left and you can make it look like the cube that's up to the right or you can will and make it look like the cube that's down to the left. That is, you can make that um, flat two-dimensional line drawing of a cube and you can make it 3D in two different ways. You can make the leading edge be the down left edge or you can make the leading edge of it be the up right edge. And you can do that at will. You can do it consciously just by flipping something, who knows what, in your mind. So imagine then if we could, for example, put you in a very sensitive, very um, good uh, fMRI machine, and we could find and zero in on exactly the brain states that are present when you're doing that switch. Imagine I tell you, okay, at 10.01, I want you to switch to one interpretation of the cube, and at 10.01 and 30 seconds, I want you to switch to the other interpretation of the cube. And we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, with me telling you what times to do what, and then we compare the tape to your mental states. And then we can look at the brain and we realize, okay, there's all of this activity in these other 82 and a half billion neurons that seems to have nothing, no correlate, no difference. It seems to make no, have no bearing on um, the, your current interpretation of the Necker cube. But look at this. Here's a firing pattern or here's a, here's a substructure or here's a, a, a sort of functional uh, grouping of neural signals that does seem to switch and correlate with you switching your consciousness from one to the other, right? So those kinds of inquiries where we're just now able in the recent decades to, to start looking at what's happening at the neural level are exposing and revealing a lot about what is happening where and how in the brain when we're going through these mental states. Okay, um, another 
uh, philosophical issue connected to some of our previous previous lectures. Functionalists, you will recall, have said that to have a mind is to be in a particular input and output system of a certain type that has specific sorts of internal states that are causally related to each other and the inputs and the outputs. So we saw with functionalists that they said, look, a, a mind is, a, is an input, is a, is a system that has inputs and outputs, and we're going to capture or describe, if we succeed, the, the, the modules that connect these inputs to these outputs. And we're going to gather up sort of the, the economy of mind and divvy up the labor into these modules, these big sort of functional segments or pieces that will trace or um, lead to the outputs that come out of the system on the other side. Okay, so the question here to ask then is, okay, what does that have to do with neurons? Um, neurons are the um, down in the weeds sort of low level um, you know uh, mechanism that seems to be doing all of this so how does your functionalist theory or functionalist map map onto um, what's happening to uh, down at the neuron level I mean does that mean do we have 83 billion functions no probably not we've got fewer than 83 billion functions so can we parse up the labor in more macro abstracted modules that maybe neurons or maybe something else could perform, you don't have to duplicate, presumably, if you're a functionalist, you don't think you have to duplicate every, the function of every single neuron in order to get a mind. There's, there's got to be some higher level of abstraction at which we can um, carve up the labor uh, of what's happening. So the question is, where do we find that level of abstract causal generalizing that comes from a a functionalist theory, do we need the full connectome? And that's the word that's being used lately, um, which is a complete mapping of all the neural connections. Or can a mind arise out of some larger functional units? And this is um, a, a challenge and a problem, I think, for modern functionalists to try to answer, okay, at what level does mind emerge? Does it have to be from the neurons up? Or can it be um, uh, the, the, the labor is performed at some higher, more abstract level. Um, and on a similar note or similar question, here's, a, here's another science fiction scenario that philosophers of mind like to worry about. Suppose we take one of your neurons and we replace it with a mechanical one, a synthetic one. And we, we build a little synthetic neuron in the lab and it does all the things that your neurons do, but it's, you know, it's made of silicon and it operates with a little battery. So it doesn't uh, work the same way yours does, but it has the same functions. It has the same inputs and output states and does all the same stuff. So suppose I swap out one of your neurons for one of those. Okay, so far so good. Would you lose consciousness? Probably not. Not from one neuron swap. Okay, suppose I replace another one and another one and another one. Suppose I replace tens of thousands of your neurons with synthetic neurons. Suppose I replace billions of your neurons with synthetic neurons. Now what happens to your consciousness during this process. Does it start to fade? Does it get to a certain threshold and just switch off where you're no longer conscious at all? What's the relationship here or what's the, um, you know, for functionalists, they've been boasting or have been claiming that ontological neutrality and multiple realizability is the mantra for functionalism, right? It says we should, in principle, be able to build a mind out of anything that mimics the functions. Well, surely if I can mimic the function of a single neuron and just replace all your neurons, that'd just be a new synthetic you, right? It would be no different. Um, uh, so maybe the way to test a functionalist and, uh, and see if they're actually resolved is uh, see if they let us do that to them. Uh, okay, so more issues, and this is going to get, um, I, I hope, going to get uh, alarming to any sort of sensible philosophy major. Uh, famous, uh, now old, experiment from Benjamin LeBay. LeBay was able to find <clears throat> neural activity in subjects that indicated as much as 500 milliseconds before they were aware of their conscious decision to push a button that they were going to push a button. That is, LeBay found neural events that successfully predicted what the subject would do before the subject was aware of their choice. Now, I won't retell the details of the, of the story. It's been widely duplicated and widely studied. 
Um, but the idea here is that LeBay was able to successfully locate and identify some neural events that when they happened, they knew that within the next second or so, the subject was going to push a button. And they knew it before the subject was even aware that they were resolved to do it themselves. They gave the subject the choice, okay, you can push the button anytime you want in the next 30 seconds. Um, and they got to where they could tell before the subject knew what they were going to do, when they were going to do it. Okay, so just assume for the sake of argument. And what I encourage you to do is go look that up and read, read more about the LeBay experiments. Um, but here's the question, of course. So are those choices free? Or maybe what's alarming about this is you might worry, well, who's running this show? Uh, LeBay can tell before you can what you're going to choose. Presumably any sufficiently advanced neuroscientist with a really fancy fMRI machine, you know, 50 to 100 years from now, we're surely going to be able to um, map enough brain events in your brain to be able to, in real time, tell better than you or tell before you what you're going to do, what you're going to order at the Mexican restaurant, right? We'll know better than you. Does that, or is there a possibility that that undermines the, the, the claim that we're free, that there, uh, this notion of free will, free exercise of choice? Okay, there's a lot, of, lot to be said here in the background. Um, and just to get you sort of more thinking on a related note about um, the neurochemical foundations of consciousness and, and decisions and thoughts, there's another recent case of a, um, a drug that's been prescribed. It's, it's a dopamine agonist, uh, which I should have checked on this. I think it... Um, an agonist is different than an antagonist. So whatever it does, it's affecting the rate at which dopamine is moving into these neurotransmitter gaps. Um, there's a drug for Parkinson's that in a significant percentage of people who take it, if you get the drug above a certain level in their system, they become compulsive gamblers or they have compulsive sexual activity. Uh, okay, so again, like now we're getting very close and confronting the neurochemical um, foundations or the core of our actions, right? There's Leibniz's mill. There's, um, there's the presence of a molecule and we get it up above a certain level in the synaptic gap or in your brain and now you're um, spending, uh, wasting your life savings in Vegas. Uh, we dial back the dose, we reduce the amount of that chemical in your brain and you no longer have the need to go gamble. And this has happened to people who never gambled before. They just suddenly um, have this urgent need to go do it. And you got LeBay telling you what you're going to do before you know you're going to do it. Okay, so there's some background concepts here we got to have. Um, this is going to be all I'll say about it all semester, but you need some basic terms. This will come back up in your metaphysics class. Um, but there's some terms and some categories of positions here. Physical determinism is this view. It's the view that every physical event is necessitated by the prior physical state of affairs. So the idea is that the physical world is locked, that there are causes that happen and they bring about, they necessitate, they force physically their events. The next event must happen according, according to the laws of physics and chemistry. And we figure that physical determinism is either true or it's false. Okay, well that has an implication for views about free will. So an incompatibilist about free will is someone who says freedom or human free, free will, whatever that is, is not compatible with physical determinism. So now there's different positions you can take here, but, but incompatibilists um, have the view that human freedom can't coexist in a world with physical determinism. So one or the other have to be true, but not both. If PD is true, then humans do not have free will. And that is, they just, they're, they're saying, look, freedom means that I have to be the cause of my actions. It can't be physics. Now, whether or not we have freedom is another question. But the incompatibilist says it has to be one or the other, not both. But they haven't resolved which. So a libertarian, then, is the next stage. A libertarian is an incompatibilist. They're saying that freedom is incompatible with physical determinism. And a libertarian says, furthermore, um, humans do have free will. So they'll assert that physical determinism must be false at some level. And what's happening is that I am the cause or my 
uh, my choice is the cause of the next event, and it's not physics that's the cause of the next event. So a libertarian is someone who thinks that um, that that my mind or I am the cause of my uh, choices or my actions, not physics. Uh, so libertarians are kind of incompatibilist. A hard determinist goes the other route. A hard determinist says that physical determinism is true and humans do not have free will. So they deny libertarianism. They say, look, everything's locked in. Physics is locked in. Chemistry is locked in. Everything you think about freedom is just an illusion. Um, we're all hard um, forced uh, caused to do what we do and you know so there was this initial state of affairs at the beginning of the universe at the Big Bang and everything that that unfolds from there on out is all just physics happening ka-chunk 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 unfolding the way it was it was all preordained or predestined in the physics itself compatibilism is the other view um, the compatibilists say that even if physical determinism is true human free will is compatible with it. You can have it both ways. Um, it, physical determinism and free will can coexist. And actually, this is by far the most popular view amongst philosophers who work on this stuff. They're mostly compatibilists. The libertarianism seems to be a, a sort of a very difficult view to, to, to defend. Um, hard to de determinism has got its problems. We're not sure about uh, about it. Um, and many people like Hume and Kant and a number of other famous philosophers have said, look, a free action is just an action that's in, in accord with your desires or your values or it's responsive to your reasons. And it can also be physically determined. Um, I mean, here's a way to think about this. Suppose um, a, a neuroscientist with a very good fMRI machine could show me the LeBay data and show me the physical events that are leading up to um, me about to make a decision. So now I am looking at my own brain states. And LeBay can say, look, here it comes. You're about to push that button. And I can say, oh, okay, so what do I do there? Okay, does the physical event or the information in LeBay's fMRI machine, does that make me make the decision? Does that force my finger to push the button? And the compatibilist says, no, what, it doesn't matter what the physics is happening. I never thought that, that physics was being violated by my brain. I didn't think there was little, little miracles going off all over my brain every time I choose a burrito. Uh, of course physics is unfolding in my brain. But for me, from my perspective, as a subject, I have to consult my desires, my values my choices, my reasons. I have to gather evidence. I have to think it through. I have to consider arguments. Like there's no other way around it. Like no matter what, how much I'm physically de determined to do something, I don't live in physics land. I live in my consciousness. And my consciousness is a place where I do things according to my wants, my desires, my goals, my plans, my arguments, my reasons. And there's no way around that. Like there's no way for me to step into the physical stream and sort of act merely physically, I have to choose, and I have to choose according to reasons. There's just no way around it. Um, this is a famously a Humean and a Kantian argument um, that says, look, um, any, any notion of free will worth having is completely compatible with physical determinism. Um, Dan Dennett's got another famous, very good book on this topic that I'll refer you to. Okay, so enough about the sort of the freedom discussion, and but but notice we're getting down to the nitty gritty about the philosophical issues that come out when we start thinking about neurons and about chemistry and about what's happening in brains. Okay, so here's another way to get at sort of the Leibnizian mill problem. Um, what do we make of drugs? Uh, some people, some philosophers, some poets, and some other people. Here's a quote from William Blake have thought that drugs um, could do a lot for knowledge. Um, it's not clear that Blake was talking about this, but I'm, I'll tell you what it means in a second. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through chinks of his cavern. And that's actually an allusion to Plato's cave, I think. So William Blake's a famous romantic poet from the um, early, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. And, this, and here's Blake sort of dealing with the same problem. Like, 
okay, I'm navigating the world with a brain, with a with a system, with my 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 faculties of perception. What about the nature of things out there really in themselves, like as their real nature, as they are not as I perceive them with my apparatus, but as they really are in themselves. And Blake is being inspired by Kant. That phrase comes from Kant, as knowing the noumenal reality as it is in itself. Well, here's you. You are a brain, or you're emerging from brain processes, and you're trying to get to reality. You're trying to get to the realness, the thing that's in there. Okay, so famously, I've got these in the reverse order. Aldous Huxley, a philosopher, psychologist, um, a towering intellect from the late 1800s, writes this book, maybe early 1900s. Huxley writes this book, The Doors of Perception. And in, in that book, he ingests a, um, a, a, a quantity of mescaline. It's the hallucinogenic substance that's in uh, peyote cactus. So Huxley takes the peyote, I think, and then he writes this essay about this wild hallucinogenic trip he goes on. It's a short book, and it's really well written, and it's a brilliant book. Every philosophy major should read it. Okay, so uh, Jim Morrison, you may recognize, from The Doors, reads that book and gets the name for The Doors from that book. Okay, so here we've got this whole sort of intellectual circle being connected uh, between all these people. And then later, of course, or contemporary, we've got Timothy Leary, who is suggesting straight up, he actually gets fired from Harvard's psych psychology department for suggesting that when you do LSD, you are actually tapping into reality as it really is. You are um, peeling away the artifice of your brain, and you're getting to the real authentic reality down there behind the doors of perception. Um, so just to get you thinking about this, and to give you a couple of other references, a recent book on the effects of uh, a really great book by a journalist professor, journalism professor, famous author, Michael Pollan, wrote this book, How to Change Your Mind, and it's all about psychoactive drugs and how they change and how they affect our sort of conscious states. Okay, so more sort of things to get in your head, thinking about, triangulating about the relationships between brains and minds, and what is it to be conscious, and what's the character of consciousness, and another bit of research that I've gotten really interested in lately. Um, is from this Robin Carhart Harris, who wrote this article that actually gets referred to in Michael Pollan's book, um, but he's doing research on um, uh, psilocybin mushrooms and, and its therapeutic effect on consciousness for people who have um, uh, OCD or PTSD or severe depression or other severe cases, right? Where somebody's locked into a kind of repetitive or rigid or dogmatic or confined um, ideation where their minds get stuck in a rut and they can't get out um, and they're using uh, psycho, uh, they're using psilocybin mushrooms to um, put them through these sort of therapeutic uh, trips and it turns out to have a therapeutic effect and it helps sort of fix some of these people's problems using drugs to change sort of the character and nature of what's going on, on the inside. Okay, so other background here. Famously, Albert Hoffman accidentally, he's working for a, a, chem a pharmaceutical company, Sandoz, and he accidentally, accidentally discovers LSD in 1943. And he, um, he gets some on him, and I don't know whether he got it just on his skin or in his mouth. And famously, he goes home from the lab, and he starts just tripping, tr tripping balls on the way home on his bicycle. And he thought he'd poison himself. He thought he was going to die. This is the first guy who ever took an LSD trip. So, Hoff, so famously, there's a there's a day they call it Bicycle Day, where where Albert Hoffman tried to get home from the lab on his bicycle after he invented LSD. Uh, okay, so again, LSD binds to a serotonin receptor at the synapse, and it produces all of these interesting different visual and auditory hallucinations. So you get all these different drugs that produce different subjective states of mind for the uh, for the subject. Uh, okay, some other really interesting research that's going on that's relevant to what we're talking about with NCCs. Um, recent work, uh, some of this is in Carhart Harris and some of this is mentioned in Pollen, but recent work has, um, very recent neuroscience has, has, has um, uh, zeroed in on something that they now call the default mode network. 
And what that is, is this is not the macro level. We're talking about sort of big brain structures. This is the large scale brain network that includes the medial prefrontal cortex, posterior cingulate cortex, and the angular gyrus. And what this thing does is um, this thing steps up its activity when we're not engaged in an effortful task. So if you give me a task to do, if I'm supposed to, um, uh, you, you give me a little puzzle and I start putting the puzzle together. Okay, the activity in the default mode network drops off and all this other activity in these other parts of the brain, they ramp up while I solve the puzzle. But then when the researcher says, okay, stop solving the puzzle, you can just sit and wait for a few minutes until we start the next round. Okay, so now I've got some time to myself and I just sit here. The default mode network comes back up and now I start to daydream or my mind wanders and I start uh, and the default mode network takes over. So it's, it's the default state or the network in the brain that takes over when I'm not doing something else that's got my attention. Okay, so it looks like that the default mode network is connected up to What's the basis for my, autobiogra uh, my autobiography, like my story about myself to myself, my self-reference, my theory of mind, being able to see, sort of keep track of who's thinking about what and how much do they know and how much do they not know. It, it's, it's connected to moral reasoning, social evaluations, remembering the past, imagining the future, episodic memory. Like none of those things are on your mind when you're busy with a task. You get lost in the task. You get absorbed by the little project you're in, right? You're, you're doing a puzzle and that's all you're thinking about for 20 minutes and you look up and go, oh wow, where have I been? What have I been doing? Okay, that's the default mode network coming back online from the activity. So it turns out then that this, this default mode network is sort of what's keeping the self together in lots of ways, the philosophical self. And when you disrupt its activity with LSD, you suppress the default mode network. And this is discussed in Pollan's book. And creativity goes up, lateral connectivity goes up, ego dissolution happens, you know, you, you sort of the self dissolves. The reality imagination distinction gets dissolved. That, that's what it is to hallucin hallucinate, right? Somebody's on LSD, they can't tell sort of fantasy from reality, and that all gets uh, all blurred for them. Um, so one of the things that, that, that interesting things that maybe LSD does or some of these other drugs might do is suppressing and disrupting the default mode network and then causing these other kinds of lateral connections and people reporting creativity and coming up with all these new ideas and the like. All right, so, um, you know, Leibniz's mill problem is looking less and less problematic, or at least... The, the correlates, the narrow correlates of consciousness seem to be, seem like they're just around the corner that we're getting closer and closer to them. And you may know about MDMA or ecstasy. I mentioned this earlier. It binds for receptor sites for serotonin and dopamine. Um, and that means that more serotonin and dopamine end up in, in the synaptic gap. And one of the effects of MDMA is euphoria or happiness or self-confidence, sociability, empathy, and the like. So again, there's more sort of clear the foundation of so much of what we think is essentially human and part of consciousness depends on the synchronized metabolic activity of neural networks. I mean, we're getting, we're, we're seeing the mechanism at work and how it unfolds. And that also raises the question of what other varieties of consciousness could there possibly be that get produced out of the operation of physical systems. Okay, so the summary then here is uh, we've got some highlights and some important terms about um, how neurons work, the parts of neurons and how they transmit. Um, so I'm going to hold you responsible for all those concepts. Um, and you're definitely responsible for long-term potentiation. Um, neuroplasticity, which I don't know that I mentioned, is the um, is the fact that neurons change. They're plastic so that they acquire... What, what happens in long-term potentiation is that... Um, uh, some connections change or they get more weighted than others. Um, so plasticity just means that neurons are plastic. They change over time. So you get a bunch of signals of a certain sort and neurons adapt to that. And you get a bunch of signals of a different sort and neurons adapt to that. Or somebody gets has a stroke and has some brain damage and other parts of the brain can learn and develop. They're plastic. They, they um, adapt so that they can then compensate for the thing, this ability of the skill that you lost. Furthermore, um, we are asking the question, at what level of activity does consciousness emerge? 
We've wondered that, that about in connection with functionalism. Um, does it come out of the molecular, the neural, the module level, the network level, or at the connectome level? There's lots of different ways to sort of, you know, places to zoom in and ask. And we started asking this question about what are the NCCs, so you need to know what those are and um, sort of understand the importance of the project for NCCs. And we briefly talked about this question about human free will and what the connection is to physical determinism, libertarianism, hard determinism, incompatibilism, and compatibilism. So there's more terms you need to know. And we've started wondering what do mind-altering drugs indicate about consciousness, about reality, about ways of knowing, about personal development. And then that's also suggested that neuroanatomy, neuroscience, and pharmacology are giving us insights into the chemical and physical basis of consciousness has been my sort of suggestion and answer to Leibniz's problem. All right, so next time we'll be moving on to connectionism and starting to use some of this background about, about, the, about the nature of brains or what we know about brains to understand um, how can we possibly build uh, minds, maybe like an artificial mind.